Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Cordant and in this video I'm going to go over the process and the overall uh, vision that I have for my main character that I will be using in my Last Atlantic playthrough in the channel. So the first video of that playthrough I go over the, um, the character creation but I don't really go into a lot of detail as to exactly what I'm picking, what are gonna be my multi-class options, what I will be picking as we level up from level 1 to level 20. So the purpose of this video is exactly that. We're gonna delve into the details of why I am doing what I'm doing, what is my objective for this character, how are my multi-class options going to be and why, um, so we can have a good idea of the purpose of the character, how it's going to play out during the course of the game in a more detailed fashion. So, I am just picking, I'm on the, the character creation screen over here and I'm just picking my, my portrait from the playthrough, which I like a lot. I think you can get some notion maybe of what I'm going for um, in my playthrough. And first, we are going to be discussing the different classes that will make part of my character. I think this is the, more, the, the most important or one of the most important parts of the character creation is picking your classes. So what is exactly the purpose of my character? The purpose of my character is going to be um, a frontline martial character, someone who can hold a weapon, be in the frontline, taking the attention of the enemies, tanking the enemies and also dishing out a lot of damage by using weapons, so a martial character, but at the same time I also want him to have spell casting capabilities. Uh, more specifically, I want to have access to arcane magic. The reason for that is, in especially initially, not to be um, what you would imagine like a wizard in the backline casting spells at the enemies. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to have access to powerful defensive buffs, defensive magic that will protect my character in melee, make him sturdier, make him harder to hit, just give him additional layers of, of protection while he's in the front line, while at the same time also providing very useful buffs for the rest of the party. Now, eventually, once we start getting some mythic level, um, some mythic spells, once we start getting some high-end abilities from certain classes we'll be using, then we're gonna start making a, a subtle switch into also using some offensive magic as well. Because for the first levels, um, offensive magic is not really gonna be part of what this character will be doing. He will be hitting enemies with weapons while making himself safe with arcane magic and also providing useful buffs for the entire party. That is the main goal of this character. The way we achieve this is through multi-classing. And we are going to be multi-classing into four different classes. I know this may sound like a lot, but I am going to do my best to explain exactly why these classes are so useful and how they work together so you can have a good notion, a good understanding of why I am picking these classes and how they work together as well. So, to start, we're going to be focusing on our two primary classes for the start of the game. And I'm going to begin with the spell casting side of things. So, since we want access to arcane magic, we could pick any class that has arcane magic. I am going for the sorcerer. Uh, the main reason for the sorcerer is that I love sorcerers. My favorite class in any CRPG is the sorcerer. It is a very powerful spellcaster. It has access to bloodlines, which gives him some flexibility, some additional abilities. It is a spontaneous caster, which is, you know, has its pros and its cons, but I am used to using a spontaneous caster for this purpose. So I like the sorcerer. He is going to be my pick to give me the part of arcane magic. Uh, and by the way, something I want to mention in case I, I, I refer to him as in a different name. <laughs> Uh, what people call this kind of character is a Gish, a Gish character. I don't actually know the origin of this name, I'm using it because I've heard it. 
that's basically why. Um, but what a Gish character is, is exactly this. It is a martial character, a hybrid character, that has a martial component backed up by a spellcasting component. So if you hear me call him a Gish, that is why. So like I was saying, for uh, my spellcasting side of things, I am going to be going for the Sorcerer. It is my personal preference, you could go for many other classes. Now, the Sorcerer, if we look at our spell progression over here, in and of itself will not make a decent uh, martial character. And I will explain why. When we look at the character progression, we can kind of look at this as kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, if you can imagine it like that. We have several rows, in this case we have like three rows, and we have multiple columns, 20 columns in fact, one for each level. And one thing to know, uh, a lot of people don't know this, at least initially, <laughs> if you mouse over these symbols, you will get a pop-up explaining a few things. And the same thing over here. So this is your martial component, the first row is your martial component, and the second row is your spellcasting component. So, for example, here you can see that at level 1 you gain access to level 1 spells, and you can even see which spells you get, okay, or you can pick from, I should say. At level 4 you get access to level 2 spells, at level 6 access to level 3 spells, yada yada yada, all the way up to level 9. Also something to note, for this character I do prefer having a spellcasting class that can go up to level 9 spells, because I want to have access to the highest level spells, instead of, for example, a bard that can only reach, I think, level 6. So I do have a personal preference for higher level spells, I think it's better. Uh, but yeah, you can see your spells over here, and... Like I was saying, because we're discussing the, the potential for a sorcerer to be in melee or to be a martial character, we want to take a look at this first row. So, the reason for this is, I want to discuss base attack bonus. This is something that I know can be very confusing for new players, it was for me as well when I started. Uh, I came from Baldur's Gate where I was used to tackle or two hit chances, and from Pillars of Eternity where you just have accuracy, and this one felt a little bit weird, or, well, at least different. So let's read what this does. Base attack bonus, or BAB for short, each creature has a base attack bonus and it represents its combat power. As the creature gains levels or hit dice, their base attack bonus improves. When a creature's base attack bonus reaches plus 6, plus 11, or plus 16, it receives an additional attack in combat when making a full attack. Base attack bonuses increase at different rates for different character classes. Very important. Each consecutive attack gained from base attack bonus has a cumulative minus 5 penalty. For example, if your BAB is plus 12, the first attack has a plus 12 bonus, the second attack has a plus 7 bonus, and the third attack has a plus 2 bonus. So, this last paragraph is not gonna matter for what we're discussing here, but the first one is very important. Specifically the part where it says, this increases at different rates for different character classes. I also want to make another distinction here which is very easy to get confused about. You have base attack bonus, emphasis on base, it is your BAB, uh, and you can only get BAB as you level up your character. You don't get it from anywhere else. Well, I guess with with some very specific exceptions, like the transformation spell. But for the most part, you only get BAB through leveling your character. In the actual game, you have a whole lot of options to increase your attack bonus. Not your base attack bonus, just your attack bonus. So like I mentioned, your attack bonus will determine or will help you hitting your enemies with weapons. So if you are attacking an enemy, in order to determine if you are going to hit that enemy or not, what happens behind the scenes is, the game simulates the roll of a 20-sided die, and based on the result of that dice roll, it is going to add your attack bonus to see if you can overcome the armor class of the enemy. If you roll higher, 
than the enemy armor class, you hit. If you roll lower, you miss. That's how it works. And as I mentioned, in the game you have a lot of different options to increase your attack bonus. Uh, your weapons can increase your attack bonus. Um, you have a bunch of personal uh, buffs that increase your attack bonus. Your party can buff you through various means that will also increase your attack bonus. But it is not base attack bonus. The difference here, or the main difference here is that when a creature's base attack bonus reaches plus 6, plus 11, or plus 16, you get an additional attack. So, if your, atta if your base attack bonus is, let's say, 2, even if you somehow manage to buff yourself with plus 100, you still only attack once per round. So it's very important to take into consideration your base attack bonus. Okay. So why do I mention this? If we look at our character progression, we can see right here, we have these little symbols, which will show you, as you level up, what you are actually gaining on each level up. So, for example, you have empty ones, which give you nothing, and you have other ones like this one, which gives you, you know, you can see how your saving throws will shape up at this level, and the same thing as your base tag bonus. So for level 1, on the Sorcerer, you can see you don't even get the base attack bonus. You have a plus 0. At level 2, you get plus 1. Then, at level 4, you get an additional plus 1, which makes it plus 2. And if we look all the way up level 20, we will see we have, at most, a bonus of plus 10 attack bonus. Or plus 10 base stack bonus, sorry. Plus 10 BAB. So, what this means is that at level 20, you only have a plus 10 bonus to hit your enemies. And, as we saw, we get an extra attack at level 6, another one at level 11, another one at level 16. Which means with plus 10, you only get a single bonus attack. So, for a martial character, if you want to hit your enemies with weapons, you want to have this as high as possible, and you want to have as many attacks per, per round as possible. So, this is one of the main reasons why a sorcerer is not a very good pick for a martial character. We can also look over here at what we get, in terms of our feats and our uh, abilities. A sorcerer only has simple weapon proficiency, nothing else. He can only use weapons such as, uh, I think, a dagger, um, a spear, a club. He cannot use any of the actual good weapons or the better weapons that, that the game offers. So, you also don't have a lot of choices in terms of weapons. Also, you have no proficiencies with armor, which means you don't have a good way of defending yourself at the start by using armor. Which is also very bad for a martial character. If you want to be in the front, you don't want to get hit. <laughs> you want to be armored. So, all in all, it's not a very good class to be in the front line fighting enemies with weapons. That is why we must multi-class to obtain such things. So if we look at, for example, the fighter class, we can compare, right? So comparing with the fighter, a fighter has proficiency in light armor, medium armor, heavy armor, he has simple weapon proficiency, martial weapon proficiency, shield proficiency, tower shield proficiency, so he has a whole bunch of proficiencies which will, which will make him good at being engaged in combat. He has uh, weapon proficiencies to make him uh, good at attacking enemies, and he also has defensive proficiencies in the way of using armor. So this would make for a good martial character. So it could even make sense to make something like a fighter sorcerer or a fighter wizard. If you've played Baldur's Gate before, you would know that one of the most famous classes for being very, very powerful is exactly the Fighter Mage, where you combine your fighter side with your mage side, making it a very powerful Gish character. What is important to note in Pathfinder, though, is that you could get levels into fighter. For example, you could take a single dip, a single level in fighter, just to get all these proficiencies. That's true. But if you want to keep going with your fighter, because if, not, if you notice here, you get a plus one BAB at level one, then another one at level two, 
at level 3, at level 4. So if you look at level 20, we can see that we get a base attack bonus increment on every single level. So the fighter goes up to a plus 20, which is double the, attack, the base attack bonus that the sorcerer gets. And as a consequence, he also gets 4 attacks per round. So he also doubles the attacks per round of a sorcerer. And they are also more accurate than the sorcerer. So you, you would probably want to get more levels in fighter for this specific reason, right? You want to progress your martial capabilities. What is important to know, though, is if you start multi-classing into fighter, your spell casting capabilities do not progress. So what I mean by this is, let's say you were a sorcerer at, for example, level 6, okay? And at level 7 you decided that you wanted to go into your martial side of things and start putting points into fighter. At level 6 you have access to level 3 spells, okay? Level 1, level 2 and level 3. If you start taking levels in fighter the entire way up to level 20, your spell casting progression will stop over here. You will not get any more uh, spells. You don't get level 4 spells, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you get none of this, okay? Which is also very bad. That's not what we want. We want to keep our spell casting progression going. So how do we fix this? There are certain classes in this game which are better for a martial character progression while also retaining your spell casting capabilities. So for that, we look at some of the prestige classes. For example, Dragon Disciple. The Dragon Disciple is a very, very powerful class for any kind of, you know, Gish character. Because it gives you a good progression in terms of, of base attack bonus. You get a plus 7 out of 10 levels. It's not as good as a fighter. I mean, it's hybrid, so it has to have some kind of downside. Otherwise, everybody would just go for this and never go for a fighter. <laughs> but it is a better progression than the Sorcerer. You get a bunch of very useful abilities, like Natural Armor Increase. Uh, you get Strength Increase. You get a, another attack via a Bite. You have a lot of very good things from this Prestige class. And, very importantly, at level 2 in Dragon Disciple you get to continue your spell casting progression. So how do they actually say this here? Dragon Disciple gained new spells per day as if he had also gained the level in an arcane spell casting class he belonged to before adding the prestige class. So yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. So does not however get any other benefit a character of that class would have gained except for additional spells per day, spells known an increased effective level of spell casting. So yeah, basically, with the exception of certain levels, and this is also why up to level 4 is so good, but regardless of that, you keep your spell progression. So not only are you getting a benefit for your martial side, you get to keep leveling up in your spell casting progression. So this is one of the, um, the classes we will be multi-classing into. So we keep... Spell progression, we get some more attack bonus, or base attack bonus progression as well, and some very important abilities such as armor increase, strength increase, additional attacks per round, a breath weapon, more armor, and more strength. All of this is very, very good for a martial character. I will explain why I'm talking only level 4 in a bit. The other class capable of achieving this is the Eldritch Knight. The Eldritch Knight, we can also look over here, we get one attack bonus, or, god damn it, one base attack bonus, sorry, one BAB on every single level up. So if you look at level 10, we have a plus 10 over here. So every single level we get an increment in our base attack bonus. Not only that, but similarly to the Dragon Disciple, we also get arcane spell casting progression starting at level 2. So once you get level 2 in Eldritch Knight, all the way up to level 10, your spell casting progression will continue. 
So it is also a very good class to have for the type of character we are going for. Not only that, we also get this here, Diverse Training. An Eldritch Knight adds his level to any levels of fighter he might have for the purpose of meeting the prerequisites for feats. If he has no fighter levels, treat its Eldritch Knight levels as levels of fighter. He also adds his level to any levels in Arcane Spellcasting class for the purpose of meeting the prerequisites for feats. So, sometimes you will have certain feats, certain useful feats for combat, that have a prerequisite of some fighter levels. And if you were going for a pure sorcerer, you would never get them. With Eldritch Knight, you also get access to those. Not only that, you will also get some bonus combat feats um, as you level up in this class, which, again, just makes it even better or more appealing for your martial side of things. So, looking at this, we can see, we can have a plan for how our character is going to evolve. Oh, by the way, something also very cool about this class. At level 10, you get Spell Critical. At 10th level, whenever an Elder Tribe successfully confirms a critical hit, the next spell he casts within two rounds will be cast as a swift action as if quickened. This is excellent. This is perfect for a Gish character. Because what you want to be doing, or what you don't want to be doing as a character of this style is, you don't want to be in melee um, casting spells, basically. Because you want to be swinging your weapon, you don't want to be casting spells. You don't want to waste your action casting spells, you want to attack. With this, you can have both. You can just be attacking with your weapon, and if you crit, your next spell is basically instant. You don't have to waste time, you don't have to waste an action actually casting the spell. So, just extra cherry on top, let's say. Perfection. So we can see some sort of progression here um, for our character. Now, we need to note that these classes have prerequisites. That's why they start off in red. You cannot start your game by going Dragon Disciple or Elder Knight or anything over here. So what we want to do is, as we level up our character is, we want to obtain these prerequisites so that then we can jump into these classes. So, for example, Dragon Disciple requires you to be able to spontaneously cast arcane spells, okay, of first level. So, it's also an advantage of using spontaneous casters, like the Sorcerer, or, for example, a Bard, that a Wizard would not have access to. Okay, that's, that's something important to keep in mind, also another reason why I like having Sorcerer here. And you also need to have Knowledge Arcana at 5. Now... What this essentially means is that you need to have at least five levels of some other class before you can go into Dragon Disciple. So in this case, you need five levels in whatever class and also the ability to cast arcane spells spontaneously of level one. So something very easy for you to do with this is you pick the sorcerer. It would give you spontaneous arcane spell casting of level one right away, and then as you level up in your skills, you put points into Arcana on every single level up, for example. And once you get level 6, you will have this one, you will have this one, all your prerequisites for Dragon Disciple have been met, you can then continue. For Eldritch Knight, it, gets, it, it happens a bit later. You need to have the ability to cast Arcane spells of level 3, so it takes some time before you reach this point. So if we look at the Sorcerer, for example, we get level 3 spells at level 6. So essentially, you would be able to get into Eldritch Knight as a Sorcerer only at level 7, which for us is not a problem. And the other prerequisite uh, is you need to have Martial Weapons Proficiency. You can fix this a number of ways. So, for instance, if you had done, as I mentioned before, if you took one level in Fighter, for example, you could get Martial Weapon Proficiency that way, okay? You would also get some other proficiencies, such as, like we saw, in Armor to defend yourself. 
Now, something that's also very important to mention when we're talking about armor and spellcasting is that in this game, armor gives you a penalty to casting spells, which is something that we do not want to deal with with our character. We want our spell casting to be unimpeded. We want to cast our spells with zero arcane spell failure. There's nothing worse than being engaged in combat and you need to cast a critical spell and it just fails because you are using armor. That is another reason why taking fighter levels for this particular character is not as important because we're not going to be making use of any of these armors. We're also not going to be making use of shields because shields will also give you a spell casting penalty. So the only thing you could actually get from the fighter would be the martial weapon proficiency. Unless your other option is, but it's kind of annoying, you can take off your armor and take off your shield, buff up, and then go into combat. But that does not play well with what I want to do later. I will want to cast some spells during combat with my character, so I want to be unimpeded. Let go down. So the way we do this to obtain this prerequisite will be through a feat. When you, when you level up, you get certain feats, and one of the feats you can get is specifically martial weapon proficiency. So with a single feat, we can become eligible to pick levels into Eldritch Knight. Those are the prerequisites. So we can't get Dragon Disciple or Eldritch Knight very early. We can only get Sorcerer, right? We need to level up before we can get those. And as I mentioned, the Sorcerer isn't really that good in melee. His defenses are not going to be that good. He doesn't have armor, right? So how can we fix not having armor to make ourselves a little bit safer? The way I prefer to do it, and I think one of the best ways you can do it, is to look into the Monk class. Because monks have a very specific uh, trait, which is the AC bonus, which says when unarmored and unencumbered, the monk has his wisdom bonus, if any, to his AC and CMD. So AC is your armor class. This is what determines if you are going to get hit or not in combat. And CMD is your combat maneuver defense, which makes you... Um, which will defend you against stuff like grapple or bull rush or trip, stuff like that. For the most part, the more important one is going to be the AC. In addition, a monk gains a plus one bonus to AC and CMD at fourth level. It will increase, blah, blah, blah. The main point of the monk here is that when unarmored, which we want to be, because again, we don't want to have penalties to our spellcasting, we will always be unarmored. So this is met and unencumbered, Easy to do, because we are not wearing armor. We have a lot of strength, which I will also explain why in a second. So this will also be met. We can add our wisdom bonus to our AC. Now, this concept will apply to our character, but not with wisdom. We will actually be using the scaled fist here instead, because the scaled fist takes out this AC bonus and gives you this different one which will instead add Charisma, okay? Another reason why having a Sorcerer for this type of character is also very good, because the main spellcasting um, stat for a Wizard is Intelligence. It's not Charisma. But for a Sorcerer, or for a Bard, for example, it is Charisma. So, this is a way that, with how we want to play, which is unarmored, we can get a lot of armor, actually. Because our main casting stat will be Charisma, we want to have Charisma high, so that way we can get uh, access to casting spells while also increasing our armor class um, at the same time. It also gives you some useful um, uh, features at the start. So, for example, at level 1, you get 1 BAB. That's already a bonus. You get Flurry of Blows, which is also very, very good for a character that's not particularly good at progressing his base attack bonus. Because what Flurry of Blows does is, 
while you are using um let me see here when making a flurry of blows the monk can make one additional attack at his highest by stack bonus so if you are using a monk weapon such as for example your fists or a quarter staff you will automatically get a, an additional attack per round at your maximum base attack bonus that is a very easy way to make up for the fact that you don't get a lot of attacks early so you start at level one if you start with the monk already attacking twice per, t per round which is very very nice then you also get stuff like access to certain feats which will also help out such as dodge as a, as a scaled fist bonus feat or crane style which is also very important just a bunch of very powerful things you can get from a single level in monk this will be very important for us to be safe during the entire course of the game so let's actually um look at what we pick first at the start of the game spell casters don't have a lot of power okay if you start with a sorcerer or any kind of basic spell caster you will notice that early on in the game you can't really do much you have a couple of spells like you can cast three level one spells until you rest which might be a long time and the spells you have available offensively are not that good like you can cast a magic missile cool you're gonna deal 1d4 plus one point of force damage that's it and you can only use it three times um, while a fighter for example will start bashing enemies left and right with his sword or his hammer or whatever just be a whole lot more useful early on so typically if you are going to start or if you are going to play as a spellcaster i would always suggest going for uh, some kind of control spell such as grease to disable your opponents instead of going for offensive spells because you won't be able to do much offensively um, so if you want to be more effective early on my suggestion is start with the martial side of your build so by starting with the monk as i mentioned we already start with a high amount of ac we start with flurry of blows which means two attacks per round very very good we start with extra very nice feats as well to make us safer in combat so you're overall more useful as a monk early on than as a sorcerer so that's why i start with the monk in terms of class uh, races i like going for azimar the reason why i go for azimar is that even though i don't like the look of them but that's beside the point you get a heritage and looking at the heritages you can have bonuses to all kinds of different things so a basic azimar will give you a plus two bonus to wisdom and charisma for example you do want charisma but you don't need wisdom but if you look at angel kin here or angel blooded you will see that this one gives you a plus two racial bonus to strength and charisma now i already mentioned that charisma is the main casting stat for the sorcerer it's what allows you to cast your spells if you don't have enough charisma you will not be able to cast higher level spells so you want to have a high value of charisma at the same time for our martial component of the character strength is a determining stat so when you attack someone what will determine if you hit the enemy as i mentioned before is the dice roll it is your base attack bonus any kind of attack bonus you get from buffs or weapons or whatever and also from strength by default or dexterity in other more specific cases so in my case i will be going for strength so our main stats will be strength and charisma and the angel kin azimar gives me a plus two on both of them which is perfect right not only that you also get another buff which you get a lesser restoration for free once per day this is not a big deal but trust me it can help out especially early on in the game some enemies will poison you early on will stat drain you 
and this is the way you can actually heal that up where, where otherwise you might not be able to do it other classes. For background selection, there are a lot of choices. A lot of this can be up to personal preference. When I don't have a very specific reason to go for any of them, which in my case I don't, I don't need specifically in any of these backgrounds, I tend to go for pickpocket. The reason why I like going for pickpocket is that this will give you a plus two bonus on initiative rolls, and initiative is a good thing to have. You get to act before your enemies. You get to catch your enemies flat-footed, so you can hit them early on while exploiting a weaker amount of AC. And at the same time, you make it so that when they start attacking you, you are not flat-footed as well. So, overall, having a good initiative role is a very, very good thing. You also get trickery and stealth to the list of your class skills, which can also be very useful. Um, you may not have another companion capable of trickery or stealth in your party, and this is just a way that you yourself with your main character can take care of those roles. So I, I tend to like this one here. For our ability points, as I mentioned, Charisma for spellcasting. We go up to 18, and this here is enough. We don't need to go to 19 or 20. 18 is enough to get to our high level spells. We don't need any more. Below 18, though, I think might be risky. You, you might be risking not getting access to certain spells by having only 16, but 18, you will be good. So this is for our spellcasting side. And, let's not forget, with the Monk, this also means we get a plus 4 to our AC right here, for free. And then, for our martial capabilities, we go also for 18 strength. We could go to 19, but by doing so, we are getting a very limited amount of points for the rest of our, of our stats, which I also don't like too much. So, I think 18 in strength, 18 in charisma is a very good... Um, are very good values to have. And then, over here, I like having 14 dexterity. The reason for this is, it gives me plus 4 initiative, and dexterity will also give us a plus 2 to armor class, because if you are not wearing armor, or if you are wearing certain pieces of armor, your dexterity modifier will also be added to your AC. So, just from default values, while unarmored with this monk, we already get a plus 6 to our AC from right here. Plus 4 from Charisma, plus 2 from Dexterity, very very nice. And then, out of these three, we can argue that Intelligence and Wisdom don't matter too much for this character, but I always like having a little bit of Intelligence just to have some skill points, because even if skill points are not that important in actual combat, they will be important for other aspects of the game. So, what I tend to do is, I tend to dump Wisdom, which, you know, you get a penalty to will. Not gonna lie, it's not ideal having this penalty, but I do value more having access to other things such as Constitution and Intelligence, even if I take um, a penalty over here. So, with 4 points, I will just do... Two over there and two over here. So 12 int gives me an additional skill point and 12 constitution gives me some more HP, which is also important. Now, we don't need to go very, very high on constitution because the plan for this character is to defend himself via very high amounts of AC. So the plan is to not get hit um, and also a lot of spell casting to make him safer such as, for example, Displacement, which gives him a Concealment chance, meaning that the enemy um, uh, has a base chance to miss of 50% before they actually have to deal with his AC. Uh, mirror Images, Stone Skins, um, uh, Displacement, just a whole bunch of other ways to defend ourselves than just having an HP buffer. Having a lot of HP in these games, I don't think is a very good plan, because if you are getting hit, you die very quickly. So it's better to just try not to get hit at all, honestly. 
but you know having a little bit more doesn't hurt so 18 14 12 12 7 18 i think is a very good spread for this character here in terms of skills i'm not going to tell you what to pick you can pick whatever you feel is good for your party we can just keep in mind that by having a lot of strength we get a nice buff to our athletics because strength buffs athletics the same thing can be said for persuasion because persuasion is buffed by charisma but other than that you can basically go for whatever you want if you don't want to have any uh, anybody else focusing on trickery you can go for trickery the same thing for stealth just do not forget that you need at least five arcana um, to get into dragon disciple so this we will need to have at level five sorry we will need we will need to have five points of knowledge arcana by the time we get to level six so very important to not forget about this one as for the rest like i said athletics you can go for it because you get buffed by strength same thing as possession for charisma and the exception out of all of this is mobility for mobility we will want to have at least three points the reason for this is i don't think it actually shows over here uh, it doesn't but something you have access to in this game is a, a toggle ability called fighting defensively you can fight defensively to get a bonus to your ac but if you do so you get the penalty to your attack bonus if you get your mobility up to level three if you get three points of mobility you will mitigate some of the downsides of that uh, style of fighting defensively i think you either negate some of the penalties or you just buff the amount of ac you get honestly i can't remember right now <laughs> but yeah you do want to have three in mobility if you are planning on fighting defensively which we will be fighting pretty much the entire time this would be a good spread and then for the feats i'm not going to get too much into the feats here otherwise this video i think would be too long and very very specific um but just to get you started what i could say is we get a feat from level one and we also get the bonus feat from our scaled fist so something again to keep you safer in the in the front line is you can pick something like dodge which will give you an additional dodge bonus to your ac and then from your scaled fist bonus feet you can straight away take crane style so much as i was talking about the mobility here for fighting defensively crane style makes it so you take only a minus two penalty on attack rolls for fighting defensively which is very very good and while using this style and fighting defensively you gain an additional one dodge bonus to your armor class so just by taking these two we get an additional plus two to our ac and we get minus penalties uh, or sorry we mitigate the penalties on attack rolls for fighting defensively so this would be a very good start now with that like i said the rest doesn't matter too much i just want to go over uh, how the class progression is going to look like so i'm going to go back over here and the idea for this character is going to be starting at level one monk scaled fist for the reasons i mentioned we get flurry of blows which helps out a lot early on we get our ac bonus from charisma helps out a lot for the entire game we get an additional uh, feat from the scaled fist where you can pick crane style early also very good because you can ignore certain uh, prerequisites for this also very very nice um and you also get one attack bonus over here it's just it's just a good way to start so level one would be monk scaled fist after this we no longer take points into monk we will start going into sorcerer so this would start giving us our spell casting capabilities and also start making our way in the prerequisites for dragon disciple and eldritch knight so in this case we would get four levels in sorcerer so level two three four and five would be in sorcerer the reason for this being that at level five we get our fifth point into arcana 
we already have access to spell casting of level 1, which means Dragon Disciple is now unlocked. So as soon as we have access to Dragon Disciple, we are going to have 4 levels of Dragon Disciple. I say 4 levels because with these 4 levels you get a lot of very nice things, as I mentioned before, armor class bonuses, you get to continue progressing in your arcane spell casting, you get strength bonuses, you get bite attacks, you get a breath attack, so you get a lot out of these initial 4 levels, but after these 4 levels I think the bonuses are not as important, they're still good, but just not as important to get early on. So, we get 4 levels of Dragon Disciple. So, the way it would look would be level 1 Monk, 2, 3, 4, 5 into Sorcerer for the prerequisites. At level 6, we start going into Dragon Disciple. So, 1 level, 2, 3, 4. So, 4 levels Dragon Disciple. And then, at 10th level, we start going, uh, actually wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, correct. And then at 10th level, we start going into Eldritch Knight, because at this point, we already have access to level 3 arcane spell casting, because Dragon Disciple keeps some of our spell progression. And then once we start getting points into Eldritch Knight, we go in Eldritch Knight all the way up to level 20. So. This would give us the benefits of the monk, so we can fight in a very defensive way in the front line without having to wear armor. Again, with some spells to help out, obviously. We get spell casting from our sorcerer class. We get very nice buffs, very, very, very nice buffs for our, our uh, hybrid model in terms of getting more attack bonus or BAB getting more strength, getting more AC, and keeping our spell progression. And then Eldritch Knight for the same reasons. We get additional combat feats, we get a way to help in getting certain feats by having diverse training. We also get to keep our spell casting progression, and at level 10 we get the very nice spell critical here, where we can cast uh, spells as a swift action every time we crit. So, that is the overall idea of this character. So, I won't be going too much into the mythic level progression, because I think at that point uh, this would become kind of a different video, but the, the overall character progression, let's say, is something along the lines of starting as a monk, you can go to the front line, you can tank for your team quite reliably, you will be dishing out some damage, especially if you're using a quarter staff to make use of flurry of blows by having high strength then you start getting your sorcerer points where typically I will take more defensive spells stuff like shield um, you get mage armor from your bloodline already so you don't need to take it but you also get this and various other buff spells like enlarge parts and stuff like that I won't really be going for offensive spells that's not what this character is about. He wants to be fighting in melee with his weapons. At level 2, in terms of spell casting, again, I will go for defensive spells. Stuff like uh, Blur is very nice for your entire team. Whoops. Mirror Image is very important for yourself to keep yourself safe. So, our spell progression is mostly defensive buffs and stuff that will help out the team. And once we start, we start getting into the later levels, especially with certain mythic pots, I'm not going to spoil what I'm going to go for, although I think it's going to be somewhat obvious what I'm going to be going for, we will be getting some very powerful spells as well, that we will also be casting here and there by using uh, Quicken Rods, or by having our Eldritch Knight levels with um, Spell Critical, we can start dishing out some nice damage through our spells as well. But, for the most part, this is something that you, someone that you want to buff up as much as possible, get a lot of defensive layers on you, uh, increasing your AC, having stuff like mirror image, blur, or invisibility, or displacement, 
all those kind of things, send him into melee, have him tank the enemies and slash them up with your weapons, and eventually, as a bonus, cast some very nice spells by using spell critical or also uh, quicken rods. Also, there's nothing stopping you from just stepping back in the fight and casting some spells if you deem it necessary. You can obviously do that, but for the most part, buff up, send them in, kill everything. That is the overall purpose of my character. So, I know there's a lot of information <laughs> going on here. Uh, I believe I covered everything required for this build to work and my vision for this build. But, in any case, if you have... Oh, okay. One more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, so I was looking into the monk here. Just so I don't forget. So we have this, we have that. We have that. We have this. Uh, so mobility. No, Jarkana. Something that you will want to have. It's very important for this to work. Before you get into Eldritch Knight, you want to make sure that at certain at a certain point you pick martial weapon proficiency. If you forget to pick this as a feat at some point, and you are multi uh, and you are following what I'm doing here and not multi-classing into something that gives you martial weapon proficiency, you will not be able to get Eldritch Knight. Okay, because as I showed before, it is a prerequisite for this. Prestige class. Okay, do not forget this. Very important. So, with that, I think I am done uh, explaining this character. Um, I believe, it, again, there's a lot of information. If there is something about this character build that um, you want to know more about, or something that I said that was not obvious or clear, leave a comment below. I would. Um, be happy to help in whatever questions you might have. And if you actually want to see this character, this build working throughout the entire game, do know that there is a playthrough going on at the same time of Wrath of the Righteous, starting on hard difficulty. Potentially I'll bring it up to unfair at a certain point, although I'm not sure about that, because if there's something I hate in this game are the ambushes, and ambushes on unfair... On Last of Landy, uh, I, I iffy. I, I feel iffy about that. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to see this character playing out and how I level him up, what I take in terms of feats, character progression, and whatnot, uh, mythic levels, um, you can check out the playthrough so you can see exactly when I level up, how I do my level ups, how I approach all the different fights in the game with my character and with my party. Also, I guess you can also see. What I like to complement this main character with in terms of party synergy, what companions I like to have, how I like to use them, you have the playthrough that you can also check out. With that, my friends, I think I'm going to conclude this video. Again, if you have any questions, suggestions, anything at all, leave a comment below. If you enjoy this content, consider subscribing for more. Many more videos coming out soon, and it is also a free and easy way to support the channel. I hope to see you all in some other video, and until then, Stay safe, everyone.